Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive and today we're finishing up and continuing on with the murder of Mariah Mo Wilson that happened at the hands of Caitlin Armstrong, a woman who perceived Mo as her romantic rival in the affections of Armstrong's boyfriend, Colin Strickland. We went over a lot of information in the first part, so I've linked that first part in the description box. If you haven't seen it yet, I do suggest that you go watch it now because one always comes before two, and it definitely might be a bit hard to keep up today if you haven't seen it yet. Come back when you're done. We will wait. While we're waiting, I will tell you that I'm definitely getting sick, so... My voice is a little bit more vocal fry -y than usual. Bear with me. Sorry for the gravel in my throat. It doesn't feel very good. Also, I know I may look a little bit like I kind of just rolled out of bed and sat before you today. That's not true. I definitely washed my face and did my makeup, but yes, I wore this to bed. And it may look like just a shapeless gray shirt, but this shirt actually has a lot of sentimental value because on the back, it says Orlando, and I actually got this shirt when I was in Orlando for CrimeCon this past, what month was that? I don't even remember what month it was, but a couple months ago. And that's because I only brought like summer clothes to Florida because it's Florida, but the hotel, they kept it at a chilly three degrees 24 seven and I was freezing. And so I bought this in the hotel gift shop and it's one of the most comfortable shirts that I've ever worn. So anyways, now that, you know, everyone's gone and checked out part one and we've chatted a little bit and caught up, I'm sick and just rolled out of bed. Here we are. Uh, now let's have a quick 60-ish second recap before we get into the new information. 35-year-old Caitlin Armstrong was accused of murdering 25-year-old Mariah Wilson, who was a rising star in the cycling world and who had also taken part in a brief romantic relationship with Caitlin's boyfriend, who was also a professional cyclist, 36-year-old Colin Strickland. Now, at the time that Colin and Mo were intimate, he and Caitlin were on a break, and when Colin and Caitlin got back together, Colin claimed that he maintained a strictly platonic and professional relationship with Mo, but due to the history of Colin and Mo, Caitlin Armstrong was allegedly insanely jealous of this younger woman and really didn't want Colin talking to her, didn't like it, was passive aggressive about it, blocked Mo, um, Mo's contact from Colin's phone. Caitlin's got access to all of Colin's like social media, his laptop because she's his business manager. So she's able to go into his contacts through his iCloud on his computer and block people on his phone. And Mo wasn't the only woman that Caitlin blocked. She blocked more than one woman that Colin was talking to because apparently Colin is talking to a lot of girls all at once, but it's all professional, all platonic. Nothing uncouth happening. So while Mo Wilson was in Austin for a race, she and Colin met up for a swim and for some dinner and drinks. And afterwards, he dropped her off to the apartment of her friend, Caitlin Cash, where Mo was staying while she was in Austin. And within minutes of arriving to the apartment and letting herself in, Mo was dead. She was shot three times, twice in the head and face and once through the heart. Now, surveillance videos from neighbors showed a black Jeep Grand Cherokee in the neighborhood before and after the crime took place. And when police found out that Mo had spent the day with Colin Strickland, they paid him a visit the following day and they found an identical black Jeep Grand Cherokee parked in his driveway. So it's pretty clear at this point what kind of conclusions law enforcement are developing. Now, Colin was the last known person to see Mo alive, and the vehicle that was seen at the scene of the crime appeared to belong to him, but we know, we know that this Jeep was not driven by Colin Strickland. He drove a BMW motorcycle, because he's cool. That Jeep belonged to Colin's girlfriend, Caitlin Armstrong. So that should refresh all of our memories a bit, you know, get our juices going so that we can get into this new information without too much of a catch-up period. But before we dive in today, let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, Magellan TV. So many of you have been with me watching this channel for a while. And even those of you who have only been here for a short time probably know that I love Magellan TV 
because of the wealth of documentary films and series that they offer. And I also know that there's so many of you who have joined me in making Magellan TV your go-to for real life stories that are keeping us entertained and educated for hours. And this month I have a great recommendation for those of you who are already watching Magellan TV or for those of you who want to take advantage of Magellan TV's one month free trial, which I highly suggest you do. And then once you do, or if you already have, I suggest you watch this new true crime series that popped up on Magellan TV and it's called The Suspects on the Loose and Dangerous. It's an eight episode series and it's going over some of Australia's most hard to crack true crime cases. And like, listen, every single one of these episodes was about a case I'd never heard of. I really like hearing about true crime cases from other countries because usually I haven't heard of them. And to be honest, I think it's one of Magellan TV's best true crime series to date that I've seen, and I've seen them all, okay? And we all know how much I love murder maps. I would tell you a little bit about each episode, but they're all so riveting. I kind of don't want to give anything away. I want you guys to watch for yourselves and see for yourselves. And that's really one of the great things about Magellan TV, like murder maps, is one of my favorite Magellan TV true crime series. Now I love Suspects on the Loose and Dangerous. You're never going to run out of new and interesting things to watch because they add 15 to 20 hours of new content every single week. And you can watch Magellan TV on multiple platforms from your cell phone, your tablet, computer, smart TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, Google Play, iOS, the whole nine. You can watch documentary films and series about true crime, nature, history, so much more. They have great history stuff. All you have to do is click the link in the description box so you can start your one month free trial with Magellan TV right now and then you can watch The Suspects as well as all of the other amazing content Magellan TV has to offer. Do not hesitate to take advantage of Magellan TV's special offer of one month totally free to explore and enjoy all of their amazing documentary series and films. Remember all you have to do is click the link in the description box, sign up and start watching. You can cancel anytime, you can cancel after your one month, you can cancel after two months, you can cancel after your free trial. You can have Magellan TV for like six months and cancel them. There's no contracts, no strings attached, but I really don't think that you're going to want to cancel. Thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring today's video and today's video promises to be an extra long one. So I'm just going to tell you one more time, check Magellan TV out. You won't regret it. And without further ado, let's dive in. On May 12th, 2022, the day after Mo Wilson's tragic murder, two detectives drove to the house that was listed on Colin Strickland's driver's license. And that's when they observed in the driveway a black 2012 Jeep Grand Cherokee with a large bike rack mounted on the top and chrome around the windows, exactly like the Jeep seen on surveillance. There was also a 2002 BMW motorcycle parked at the house, which we know is the vehicle that Colin used to pick up Mo that night, May 11th, when they went for a swim and to get dinner drinks. And he dropped her off on that BMW motorcycle as well. And then there was also a 1998 Mercedes in the driveway, which I'm sure is the vehicle that Colin drove like on the everyday when he wasn't trying to impress a girl. As usual, when Detective Jason Ayers and Detective Richard Spittler arrived, Colin was working in the garage and body camera footage would be shown to the jury, which would reveal Colin's reaction to the news that his friend and one time situationship, Mo Wilson, was dead. Colin went silent for a few seconds. He then walked a few steps away from the police officers and said in a low, hushed voice, that's wild which I think is kind of a strange thing to say, a strange reaction. However, I'm sure he was completely in shock because he was just with Mo the day before, right? She's in her 20s. She's vibrant. She's healthy. She's alive. And then the next day he has two men standing in his garage saying she's been murdered. So yeah, he's like, that's wild. Actually, they didn't technically say she'd been murdered. They said she was dead, they didn't say exactly what happened, but they said they suspected foul play. So Colin then told the detectives that he had been with Mo the previous night, but he'd dropped her off at Caitlin Cash's apartment right about when it was getting dark. And then he actually went to his motorcycle in the garage to see if Mo had left behind any of her belongings when they went swimming. And something interesting, because I read the transcript of Colin's interviews with the police. I believe he had two interviews altogether. 
And he said that when he picked Mo up that night, her bike was sitting to the left of the door to Caitlin's apartment. And then obviously we know, because we talked about it in the last episode, when the police arrived after Mo was murdered, they found her bike a couple dozen feet away thrown into some bamboo. So we know that when Colin picked Mo up, the bike was just kind of leaning against, you know, the apartment that Caitlin Cash lived in. Which makes a lot of sense that Mo would leave it there as opposed to leaving it like 30 feet away in some bamboo. So Colin goes to his motorcycle. He's trying to see did Mo leave any of her belongings in his motorcycle the night before when they went swimming. And Detective Ayers said that as they questioned Colin, he could see Caitlin Armstrong through a window. She was in the kitchen pacing back and forth. Now at this time, police did not question Caitlin. But they did have Colin come down to the police station with them where he was questioned for six and a half hours. And I do think this is important because later Caitlin's defense is going to be like, oh, the police, they fixated on Caitlin from moment one. They fabricated this whole story of her being a jealous woman. It's the patriarchy. She's a jealous woman. It's the perfect story, but it's not true. And they didn't even look at Colin Strickland. All they cared about was Caitlin from the beginning. But it wasn't true because they didn't even talk to Caitlin on May 12th when they went to see Colin and bring him back to the police station. She wasn't even on their radar. They didn't think anything of it. In fact, they were probably thinking, yo, this dude's got a girlfriend at home, but he's out on a date with Mo Wilson and then Mo Wilson's dead. Maybe Colin killed Mo because he didn't want her to tell Caitlin about the affair. Maybe something happened and Mo threatened to expose him and so that's why she's dead. That is most likely what the police were thinking at this point. They were not seeing a woman walking around the kitchen and being like, oh, there's a lady we got there. Forget this guy. He didn't do anything wrong. Women are the devil. That's not how things went down. But that is how Caitlin's defense team is going to sort of pose this to us. So Colin goes to the police station, he's interviewed, and he starts talking about his relationship with Caitlin, he starts talking about his relationship with Mo Wilson, and he told the police that when Mo had come into Austin the previous October, this wasn't planned. You know, this is when they had their short like week to two week affair. He said it wasn't planned, he hadn't even known that she was coming, and he said, quote, we hadn't discussed that And then she was there and I said, oh, let's hang out. So I was mentally ready to move on. And I know after Mo left town, Caitlin's things were still at my house. We were sleeping in separate rooms and effectively, you know, Caitlin was on Bumble. I know she went on several dates with people and I never asked what they were, what extent they were evolving into a relationship, end quote. Which I think was your problem, Colin, right? Because if Caitlin was going on dates as she told her friends, she was doing it to make you jealous. She was doing it to see if you cared and the fact that you knew she was going on dates and you weren't like all in her business and being like, oh, what are you doing with this guy? Like, is it serious? Do you like him? The fact that he wasn't doing that showed Caitlin or made her feel that he didn't care. And he probably did care. He just didn't want to show that he cared. But Colin kind of uses this as a way to show the police that he felt it was weird to be broken up, him and Caitlin, to have them both going out and seeing other people, but for her to still seem to be so fixated on what he was doing and who he was seeing, and to be so fixated on Mo Wilson specifically when Colin himself didn't care who Caitlin was dating and didn't care what her dates were evolving into. And listen, Colin does not interview well. Uh, There's a lot of people out there who which is surprising to me because I I couldn't find it to be further from the truth, but a lot of people out there who think Colin has something more to do with this than he says, and maybe Caitlin is more innocent than we all think. I will explain why I think he interviews poorly and why I think his answers were kind of evasive at times during these interviews at the end of the episode when we summarize. Let me make a note so I don't forget. But I will admit that that Colin does interview, based on the transcripts, very strangely, a lot of pauses. He doesn't directly answer questions. He'll go off on tangents sometimes. I do think it's a guilty conscience, but I don't think it's a guilty conscience as in he knows what happened to Mo or he had something to do with what happened to Mo. And also what you need to know is Colin Strickland maybe has something of a temper or at least... 
a short fuse for being like overstimulated and things because we're going to see this showcased through certain interactions that he had specifically with the media during the trial. But during his police interview, Colin clearly understood that he was being questioned as a potential suspect and he gets a little passive aggressive at some points while the detective is questioning him. And they're like, hey, do you have something to say? You know, like you seem like you have something on your mind. And Colin responded, quote, I have something to say. Fuck you guys for manipulating me. Someone is grieving, but that's not relevant. End quote. The eternal victim. Colin is the eternal victim. Um... <laughs> Colin said that he felt the police were asking him questions, kind of trying to trap him, like they were were trying to lead him to a specific narrative. And Claire Carter, who's his lawyer, I believe, in, in one of these police interviews, she says to him, well, you don't have to answer. You can say you don't know. You can get up and leave. You know, no one's holding you here against your will. But Colin is clearly, like, annoyed at having to be there, having to talk to the police, having to explain his relationship with these two women as well as other women. He doesn't want to do it. He feels attacked. And I really think it's because he's probably kind of ashamed and a little bit embarrassed about his behavior and the way that he treated these women. And it's not like, oh, I, I'm guilty that I killed Mo or that I know that Caitlin killed Mo. It's like, uh, do I really have to like drag all my dirty laundry out like in front of you people that I, I don't know and I just met so he's getting defensive. But the police told Colin about the black Jeep that they saw on surveillance circling the area where Mo was staying in Austin at the apartment of Caitlin Cash, her friend. And he admitted, he was like, yeah, that's my girlfriend Caitlin's vehicle. And then he followed that up with, I knew I shouldn't have bought her that gun. Um, this is very early on in the interview, right? And I think that that's very important because once again, Caitlin's defense team is going to be like, oh, Colin said that Caitlin was just the sweetest person ever. And he did. We're going to talk about that in a second. But one of the first things he says to the police when he finds out that Mo Wilson is dead and that Caitlin's Jeep was seen near the scene of the crime at the time of the murder, the, one of the first things he says is, I knew I shouldn't have bought her that gun. So that's his gut instinct. He thought clearly in that moment that Caitlin Armstrong was capable of murder. Now here's what Colin said about his girlfriend, Caitlin. He said Caitlin was kind of a guarded person, but he also said that she was sweet and she was nice. She had her own goals. She always kept busy. There were really no red flags of her being violent or aggressive. In fact, he said Caitlin was one of the most laid back people he'd ever known. Colin told Detective Spittler, quote, I mean, if I had any, the remotest signs, the most remote signs, of somebody having an instability of mental capacity, I would not be in a close, intimate, committed relationship, end quote. Collins said if there were any signs that Caitlin, you know, wasn't right or was capable of violence, he would have extricated himself. He would have gotten a lot of space and a restraining order. But he said he saw no signs. Caitlin was an incredibly kind, caring, sweet person. She helped him take care of his aging mother. She was always there for him. He said, quote, in my experience, she has only shown absolute above and beyond examples of human compassion and thoughtfulness and care and going far out of her way for ridiculous things like ridiculous extents to help other humans. That's why I've been with her for three years. Despite having my doubts initially, if I wanted to be together for a long time based on just stupid things like, you know, the kind of clothes she wears and stuff, you know, do I think Caitlyn would kill somebody? No, I don't. I have no concept of having that much rage and ability to suspend reality for long enough to do something like that, end quote. Okay, there's a lot that we have to talk about here. First of all, whew, there's a lot. Colin says he was with Caitlyn for three years because of her givingness. Her, her willingness to give, to go to ridiculous lengths to help other people. Um, and this this makes a lot of sense, remember, because we talked last episode about how he's a dismissive avoidant. Dismissive avoidants love people pleasers because they can get away with a lot more with people pleasers. When you have somebody who is a perpetual people pleaser, they will find empathy for things that you're doing, even if the things you're doing hurt hurts them. Um, they will just want to prove their worth to you by basically bending over backwards, being the best girlfriend, the best partner, um, hoping that you'll see like, well, this person's irreplaceable. So just because Caitlin was kind and went out of her way for Colin and, and others, including Colin's mother, once again connected to Colin, it doesn't mean that she just had this like giving heart. 
Um, and, and that's it just altruistically wanted to just help everybody. It means she wanted to show Colin, like, I am someone of worth. I am someone that you should be with. I'll make your, your life better. Please don't leave me. And, you know, he said if he saw any signs of like mental instability, he would have, you know, run. I know it's hard to understand or explain, but just because somebody murders somebody else, it doesn't mean that they're mentally unstable, right? In fact, often it has nothing to do with mental instability. It's usually a motive like sex, jealousy, love, money, greed, um, anger, you know, things like that. It's not like this person is just completely off their rocker. And then he says things like, you know, I questioned whether I wanted to be with her long term because of stupid things like the clothes she wore and stuff. But I stayed with her for three years because of how kind she was. That's the point. That's why she bent over backwards for you. That's why she did everything for you. Because she knew you were picking on her about small things like the clothes she wore. Which, by the way, what a dick, okay? I'm not defending Caitlin Armstrong because she's definitely a murderer. Uh, allegedly, in my opinion, don't come for me, but she's been convicted. So I don't even have to say that. She's definitely a murderer. But damn, what a dick, Colin. Like, and, and this is also what dismissive avoidance do. They try to find the little things about you to show them that you are not the one, that you're not compatible with them. These are usually dismissive avoidance who are also maximizers, meaning that this person, like Colin Strickland, is always going to think that the next best thing for him is right around the corner. So he's going to find flaws, flaw find the person and the partner that he's with, hoping and, and believing that like, oh, I will find somebody better. I can find somebody better than this. I can find somebody who checks all my boxes. Now, I don't know what clothes Caitlin wore that he didn't like, but it really doesn't matter because um, it doesn't matter. You're not wearing the clothes and, and that's weird. That's weird that you'd have a problem with the clothes your girlfriend wears. And then Callan says something like, I have no concept of having that much rage and the ability to suspend reality for long enough to do something like that. Once again, Colin is speaking from his perspective. He has no concept of being emotionally dysregulated enough to lash out in this way because he's a dismissive avoidant. He suppresses his emotions. He hides them. He's consistently in control of them. So he doesn't understand how somebody could have such strong emotions and feelings that they would lose control of those emotions and feelings and that they would do something without thinking about the long-term consequences, which he does discuss in this interview. He says like, why would I throw my life away, spend the rest of my life in prison? I would never be angry enough to do that. I, I can't imagine why she would do this. I, I, I can't understand it. Just because Colin can't understand it, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. People have different experiences. We can receive the same stimuli and react differently. And I always say, Life is not about what happens to you. It's about how you react to it. Now, Colin's going to react calmly, detached, coldly. He's not going to let anybody drive him to a point where he's out of control of his own behavior. Caitlin may not be of that same mindset. And, and anxious people do let their um, triggers and things kind of fester and, and just build in them. And it causes them to act impulsively it causes them to act almost like a drug addict like they can't control themselves they have to chase whatever it is that they think they're chasing and so it makes perfect sense to me that Caitlin would be able to do something like this to Mo many people have killed in anger before but Colin cannot understand it and then Colin told the police about the two guns he had purchased for himself and for Caitlin. He said initially he had purchased two similar Sig Sours brand new, and then he said he wanted something a little bit bigger. So a few weeks later, he went back to McBride's to exchange his Sig Sour for a Springfield because they had the Springfield in stock and it felt less cheap and janky. His word, not mine, although I do use the word janky all the time. I just wanted you to know that I'm not paraphrasing in this situation, Colin said janky. Now, Colin also said he had never shot any of the guns, but Caitlin and her sister Christy had been bringing the guns to the range for practice. And he knew that both Caitlin's gun, the Sig Sauer, and his gun, the Springfield, had been shot by the Armstrong sisters. While Colin was being questioned, police were executing a search warrant at his house. And in the house, they recovered two guns and two boxes of ammunition. So Detective Spittler asked Colin about these items. Now, apparently there were no bullets missing from either box of ammo. And so the police wanted to know from Colin, hey, are these the only two boxes of ammunition in the house? Are these the only two boxes of ammunition that you and Caitlin owned? Do you know if Caitlin purchased additional ammunition outside of these two boxes? 
and Colin said he didn't know. Now, when asked why Caitlin would have been in the area of Caitlin Cash's apartment, Colin said that both Caitlin and her sister Christy were really into astrology, and he felt or thought that Caitlin would sometimes go see an energy healer on the east side of Austin, which is where Caitlin Cash lived. When asked if anybody would borrow Caitlin's Jeep, Colin said that sometimes her sister Christy would, but Christy wasn't even in Austin anymore. Christy had met a man online, and two months prior, she'd moved to this guy's farm in upstate New York. So a, a lot's happening in this interview. I summarized it as best I could. There are actually some YouTubers who have picked apart Colin's statement and kind of showed where they feel it's suspicious and things like that. I will link this YouTuber that I'm thinking of in the description box. Once again, I don't share the same belief that Colin is suspicious as, well, he's like suspicious, man. You know, he's sus. But I don't think he's suspicious as in he's a murderer. I just think he's kind of like, you know, a fuck boy. But anyways, Caitlin was also interviewed by Austin police detective Katie Connor on May 12th. But the reason that Caitlin was brought in to the police station was not directly related to Mo Wilson. I mean, it was, but the police didn't say it was. Caitlin was actually arrested on an outstanding theft of service warrant. Apparently, the year prior, Caitlin had gotten some Botox and not paid her bill. And the Austin police used this as a guise for bringing her in for questioning. Now, of course, Detective Connor um, sits Caitlin down and begins to question her about Mo Wilson because that's what she really wants to know. Like, what happened to Mo Wilson? She don't care about the Botox you didn't pay for, Caitlin. But when Detective Connor starts asking about Mo Wilson, this causes Caitlin to ask if she needed a lawyer. Now, Caitlin never explicitly asked for a lawyer. She just asked, do I need one? Now, at one point, Detective Katie Connor was called out of the room, and when she returned, she told Caitlin that she was free to go. There was an error on the theft of service warrant. Caitlin's date of birth was incorrect. So because of this clerical error, Caitlin was no longer under arrest. At this point, Caitlin was technically not in police custody because she wasn't under arrest. She could have left any time, which Detective Katie Connor made clear because Caitlin would be like, oh, I don't want to be here. I want to go. And Connor was like, there's the door. You can go. You're not under arrest. But Connor also told Caitlin that she still wanted to talk to her about Mo Wilson. Now, it was at that point that Caitlin did explicitly ask for a lawyer. And her legal team is later going to try and make a big deal out of this. But keep in mind that legally, because Caitlin wasn't under arrest and she was free to go at any time, the Austin police were not violating her Miranda rights by not stopping the interview and letting Caitlin call a lawyer. Because as far as anybody is concerned, Caitlin and Detective Connor are just shooting the shit. They're just talking right now. Caitlin's not under arrest. As Detective Katie Connor asks questions, Caitlin continued to repeat that she wanted to leave. And each time, Connor said, well, you can leave, go ahead. But instead, Caitlin stayed. And later, Detective Katie Connor would testify that she believes Caitlin stayed at the police station because she wanted to figure out what the police knew, how much they knew. And Detective Connor says she often sees this um, when suspects are not under arrest because they're just a suspect and they, they can't arrest them yet. And the police will be like, oh, you can go. And the suspect who stays with their ass in that chair and kind of doesn't really talk, but just listens. They're trying to get a read on how much the police know. And Caitlin got a little sassy with Detective Katie Connor telling her, quote, I would love to leave. You just arrested me in front of my house, in front of my neighbors. It was incredibly humiliating, end quote. And yet, Caitlin still made no move to get up and go, humiliated as she was. Detective Connor said that Caitlin's body language throughout the interview was very still and very guarded. During the interview, Caitlin said she had no idea that her boyfriend Colin had seen Mo Wilson the day of the murder, even though we saw your Jeep on surveillance outside of Pullberger, but okay, go off. And when asked why her vehicle was in the area of Poolburger and in the area of where Mo was staying while in Austin, Caitlin said she didn't know. I have no idea why I would have been there or why my car would have been there. But she did admit that it didn't look good. It doesn't look good, Caitlin. It really doesn't. And the fact that you couldn't even say, oh, I was there to see an energy healer or I was there because my dry cleaner's in the area. Like, you couldn't say anything. And that's because Caitlin doesn't want to um, paint herself into a corner by giving an alibi that she cannot prove, in my opinion. But after leaving the police station, 
Colin Strickland went to his father's house instead of going home because he said the police were still executing their search warrant at his house. And when he arrived, he said that Caitlin was already there waiting for him. But I want to quickly talk about what the police found while they were in Caitlin and Colin's house collecting evidence and snapping photos. The police removed phones, you know, electronics, laptops, the two guns, one black, one silver, as well as the two boxes of ammunition, which remember had no bullets missing. But what we're going to find out later is the general manager of the range in Austin, it's a shooting range, he would produce a receipt from January of 2022 showing that Christine Armstrong, Caitlin's sister, had purchased a box of ammunition from his business. And it just so happened that the bullets that Christine Armstrong, Caitlin's sister, bought from the range were the same bullets that killed Mo Wilson. The police also took DNA swabs from Caitlin's Jeep. Um, they took DNA swabs from Mo Wilson's bike, from the outside of Caitlin Cash's apartment, even from, I think, inside Caitlin Cash's apartment. And Maritza Guevara, an Austin police crime scene investigator, she took several pictures from the interior of Colin and Caitlin's house. And in these pictures, we can see the kitchen table, and there's several items laid out on the kitchen table. Those items were Caitlin's U.S. passport, a U.S. passport belonging to Caitlin's sister, Christy, $500 in cash, as well as some foreign currency, and they never specify what this foreign currency is. Now, no one knew it at the time, but these things were a blatant prediction of what Caitlin Armstrong was planning for her next steps. Colin says that after leaving the police station, both he and Caitlin were stunned about what had happened to Mo Wilson. Shell-shocked, he called it. He said they didn't talk much about it, although he did ask Caitlin where she'd been the day and night of May 11th. According to Colin, Caitlin gave him a list of her whereabouts from the day before. She said she'd gone to a waxing appointment, then to a yoga class, and then she'd visited an energy healer. Now, according to Colin, that was the extent of their conversation about Mo Wilson. And he said that night, he and Caitlin tried to sleep, but they weren't that successful, you know, because... It was all very upsetting. And the next morning, they walked to a coffee shop a few blocks from their house. They wanted to get coffee together to maintain a sense of normalcy, as Colin Strickland would put it. And as they walked back, Caitlin mentioned to Colin that the police had taken their phones. And she was like, we probably should get new phones. And so Caitlin went to Walmart to get a new phone and Colin went to Verizon to do the same. This would have been on May 13th, I believe. And after this, Colin headed to Lockhart, Texas, where his business, Wheelhouse Mobile, was located. This is the business where he refurbishes old Spartan trailers. Caitlin works for this business as well. And according to Colin, this is the last time he ever saw Caitlin because she was supposed to meet him out there, but when he got home, he found a note from her saying that she'd tried to drive his mother's car to Lockhart to meet him, but then she'd smelled gasoline, so she thought better of it. But then she was just gone. She wasn't there. She wasn't home. She didn't say where she was going. She didn't say, like, what it was happening at all. She didn't say why she was driving his mother's car because she did have her Jeep. She didn't say anything, and none of it really makes sense. Colin had no information about what Caitlin was doing or where she was going, but we know where Caitlin went. It appears after Colin left for Lockhart, Caitlin drove to a CarMax dealership in South Austin where she sold her Jeep Grand Cherokee for a little over $12,000. She then went to the Austin airport, took a flight to Houston, where she boarded a connecting flight to LaGuardia Airport in New York City. On May 18th, Caitlin was dropped off at Newark Airport in New Jersey where she was captured on surveillance video wearing a face mask and a blue denim jacket and carrying a yoga mat. But that's where the trail went cold for a bit. Initially, police said they don't really know what Caitlin did in New York City for four days. Um, I think that she probably met up with her sister. Her sister was in New York at the time, but we don't know that for sure. It doesn't really matter what Caitlin did in New York City for four days because after that, the police didn't know where she'd flown to because she wasn't booked on any outgoing flights from Newark. However, within no time, law enforcement realized that although Caitlin Armstrong had not taken any flights out of Newark, Christine Armstrong had. And Christy, as we've talked about, was Caitlin's younger sister. Caitlin had used her sister's passport and credit cards to book a flight from New Jersey to Santa Teresa Beach in Costa Rica. 
This was a day after a warrant had been issued for her arrest. And what was Caitlin Armstrong doing in Costa Rica? Well, she was doing a lot of things, none of which would support what her lawyers would later claim, which is that she was just traveling for the love of travel. Oh, and then she was scared of Colin, and that's why she left. We're going to talk about that. But um, no, that's not what Caitlin was doing. She was actually staying at a hostel. She was teaching yoga. This is like a touristy beach town, lots of yoga retreats, things like that. Kind of the perfect place for Caitlin, who, by the way, I don't know if we talked about this, but not only did she work for Colin Strickland, but she was also a yoga instructor. She loves yoga. So yeah, Caitlin was there kind of teaching yoga, laying low at a hostel, but that's not all she did. She also drastically changed her appearance, which we're going to discuss in a minute. And she was using multiple aliases while in Costa Rica, not her, her own name ever. All right, so let's recap. Mo Wilson is shot to death on May 11th. Caitlin Armstrong and Colin Strickland are interviewed by police on May 12th. At first, Colin Strickland is the main person of interest because he's the last person to see Mo alive and there was a romantic relationship. So, you know, it kind of just makes sense. But once police find out that the black Jeep seen on surveillance outside of Caitlin Cash's apartment was actually driven by Caitlin Armstrong, they now start to focus on her. So she's arrested. She's brought into the police station for an outstanding warrant for theft of services, Botox, you know, that she didn't pay for. How do you get Botox and not pay for it, by the way? Like, what kind of place is just letting you, you know, get your Botox, which is expensive, and then leaving on a, you know, I owe you one basis. But anyways, because of a clerical error on the warrant, Caitlin's allowed to leave. She's no longer under arrest. On May 13th, Colin heads out to go to his business in Lockhart, Texas. Caitlin says she'll meet him there, but instead she brings her Jeep to a local CarMax. She sells it for 12 k Keith Cox, the general manager of the CarMax location, would later testify that Caitlin did not fill out her last name on the forms for the car sale. And she also wrote that the payment in the form of a check should go to Christy Armstrong. But then she crossed that out and wrote Caitlin Armstrong where she had previously written Christy Armstrong. I don't know if it's because Caitlin was just like trying to see herself as Christy Armstrong because she knew that was the alias she was going to be traveling under or if Caitlin wrote Christy Armstrong just trying to hide from everyone and then realized like, oh, I'm not going to be able to cash this because I'm not Christy and like I'm going to bring it to my bank so I can cash this check. So then she wrote her own name in it. But either way, that check was handed to her that same day and she's going to use this money now to buy plane tickets, to pay for this hostel in uh, Costa Rica. And we're going to also see that Caitlin uses her sister's name and identity quite a bit in the following days. Caitlin and her yoga mat flew out of Boston. They ended up in LaGuardia Airport on May 14th. She remained in New York for four days before flying out of New York International Airport, headed for Costa Rica, not using her name or passport, using her sister's name and passport. Okay, after that, authorities claimed they lost Caitlin's trail. But then a search ensued for her that lasted 43 days, during which Colin Strickland sort of withdrew. He deactivated his social media. He kept a low profile. He said he was scared. You know, he was scared of Caitlin and also probably, you know, just in general, people are giving him a lot of shit for being at the center of this love triangle. Actually, Colin Strickland got dropped by Red Bull during this whole scandal, if you want to call the loss of someone's life a scandal, but I guess that's how Red Bull saw it because they canceled their contract with him. I'm actually going to look that up before we finish this video and see if he's like back in good graces with Red Bull and, and other sponsors because yeah, for a while, no one wanted to touch him. He really suffered professionally because of this. Now, Caitlin Armstrong ended up in a tiny beach town in Costa Rica. It's called Santa Teresa. And allegedly, Caitlin's love of yoga led authorities to this specific place because, like I said, Santa Teresa is known for its many yoga retreats and spas. And many Americans and other expats go there wanting to start fresh and get in touch with themselves and nature. So they go there to reinvent themselves. And that is exactly what Caitlin Armstrong wanted to do, what she tried to do. Which is why after checking into the Don John's Yoga Lodge, Caitlin dyed her hair darker and she cut it in an attempt to change her appearance. But that's not all she did. Uh, we're going to get there in a minute. On May 17th, 2022, the Austin Police Department issued a warrant for Caitlin's arrest. 
This was the day before she flew out of Newark to Costa Rica. Once law enforcement figured out which country she'd flown to, they sent Deputy Amir Perez of the U.S. Marshals to Costa Rica to locate Caitlin. He and a small team went undercover. They began talking to locals. They went to different yoga studios because they saw that Caitlin had her yoga mat when she was at the Newark airport. And they were like, okay, well, we got to go somewhere that like people go when they want to do yoga, which is kind of crazy that you would just like start with an entire country and then narrow it down to this small beach town, Santa Teresa, but they did it. They, they did it through good old-fashioned detective work, allegedly. That's what they said. And so the police and the U.S. Marshals with Amir Perez, they were led to this small tourist town on a beach. It's got one main road, plenty of yoga hostels, and Deputy Perez kind of starts going to each of these hostels. He's talking to people. Hey, has anybody seen this girl? Um, do you know of an American woman in town lately? Blah, blah, blah. And he's led to this one specific hostel. Now, on June 29th, 2022, Deputy Perez approached Caitlin as she sat outside on the patio of the Don John Hostel. And later, when he would testify, Perez said, quote, initially, it didn't appear to be her. But as I got a little closer, I confirmed that it was her. It appeared she had a bandage on her nose. And her lips looked a little bit swollen. The hair we were looking for was a bit lighter. End quote. Deputy Perez began speaking to Caitlin in Spanish, asking her how much the hostel cost to stay in for a night, and he claims that she took out her phone and used Google Translate to understand what he was saying and then to respond to him, and they sort of chatted, and she told him her name was Caitlin Armstrong. Now, at this time, Deputy Amir Perez could not place Caitlin under arrest because it was not his jurisdiction, but he did cooperate with local law enforcement who were able to take Caitlin into custody where she would eventually be deported from Costa Rica on the basis of illegal entry and extradited back to Austin, Texas. Now, when police searched the locker that Caitlin had been using at the hostel, they found her passport as well as her sister Christie's passport, and they found a receipt for almost $7,000 worth of plastic surgery. Caitlin, in an effort to change her appearance, had a chin lift and a nose job on June 23rd in Costa Rica, and she did this using the alias Allison Page. When police asked her, why do you have a bandage on your nose? Like, what happened to your face, bro? Caitlin told them she'd hurt herself in a surfing accident. But clearly, you can tell from the side-by-side -side picture of before plastic surgery Caitlin and after plastic surgery Caitlin, she had some work done, okay? But Caitlin wasn't starting over in the sense that she didn't remember what she had done. She didn't remember where she'd come from. The same day she was arrested, before she was arrested, Caitlin Factory reset her phone, essentially deleting all the data on it. But police were able to still recover some evidence from the phone, and a forensic detective extracted the phone and analyzed Caitlin's iCloud account. While in Costa Rica, Caitlin was very curious about a lot of things, such as what was going on back in Austin. On May 27th, Caitlin searched Mo Wilson's name and studied articles about the murder investigation. She also did searches for her own name. She also wanted to know if the IMEI of a phone could be tracked, if it wasn't being used to actively make calls, and she wanted to know if pineapples could burn your fingerprints off, which everyone got a little chuckle out of during the trial. A much needed moment of levity in a very emotionally heavy and sad case because they brought up like a latent fingerprint expert and they were like, oh, do you know if pineapples can burn your fingerprints off? And she was like, well, you would have to be holding a lot of pineapple for a long time for that to happen. She's like, as far as I know, that is never in the history of anything anywhere happened. Like, it, it, I don't think that it's the case. Was Caitlin trying to figure out how to burn her fingerprints off? so that she couldn't like be identified and she could really become anonymous and become someone else. Can you burn your fingerprints off? Can you? Like, let's look it up just for shits and giggles. So there is something called the burn method that you can use to alter your fingerprints. You can use a heat or chemical source to burn the fingertip. The burn method is intended to scar or obliterate the print. If the affected area is small, like the burn part is small, fingerprint examiners can use other areas of the fingers that contain sufficient prints to attempt to establish identity. But here's the thing, like what does it matter if you burn and scar your fingertips to the point where nobody can get your fingerprints? It doesn't, you still have DNA, like we can still prove it's you. 
Why would you do that to yourself? Okay, so in Caitlin's iCloud account, they found a deleted note. The note had been deleted on May 12th, the same day Caitlin and Colin were interviewed by police about Mo Wilson's death. And the note consisted of a list of addresses. And one of these was the address of Caitlin Cash. Caitlin Armstrong also deleted the Gmail account she used to book her flight to Costa Rica. And I'm telling you all this because later, Caitlin's lawyers are gonna try and tell us who, you know, I think I could speak for all of us here and say we have two brain cells to rub together and make a spark. These lawyers are going to try to, to convince us that Kaylin Armstrong wasn't running from the repercussions of what she did. She was just traveling like she always did. One thing had nothing to do with the other. Never mind that she used her sister's passport and credit cards. Never mind that she cut and dyed her hair. Never mind she literally got plastic surgery in an attempt to look like someone else. And she's wondering whether pineapples can erase her fingerprints. Never mind all of that pesky little, you know, details. But if that wasn't enough for you to indicate that Caitlin Armstrong is guilty and was trying to get away, let's talk about what happened after she was in police custody for months because that bitch tried to get away, run away from the police the first chance she got. Okay, so during the months between her arrest and her escape attempt, video footage from the detention facility that Caitlin was in showed that she was exercising vigorously. She was running, she was doing squats, she was practicing yoga every day. But apparently Caitlin was also complaining about an injury and so she had to be taken to an orthopedic doctor on October 11th, 2022 by Officer Rosalda Johnson and another police officer. Now Officer Johnson testified that before leaving the doctor's office, Caitlin had a metal chain wrapped around her waist that was attached to handcuffs because she'd actually gotten a doctor's note saying that she could not be shackled at the ankle so they could only shackle her at the wrists. So these two police officers and Caitlin leave the doctor's office Office. Officer Johnson held the door of the police van open so that Caitlin and the other officer could get in, but as Johnson turned to address a nurse who'd followed them out with some forgotten paperwork, Caitlin Armstrong made a run for it. She dashed, man. She she dashed so hard and so fast. According to CNN.com, quote, as she ran, Armstrong removed her black and white striped gel uniform pants to reveal she had thermal pants underneath in an effort to disguise her appearance as an inmate. Armstrong was also able to free one of her hands from her restraints. During a later search of her cell, investigators found a broken, thin piece of metal that could likely be used to remove a handcuff. During the pursuit, Armstrong tried to scale a six-foot fence before an officer pulled her down, causing them both to fall. But Armstrong immediately got back up and kept running, end quote. This is her in a seemingly cliche black and white striped prisoner jumpsuit, actually trying to escape from two corrections officers, one of whom falls after they were walking her back to a transport vehicle following a doctor's visit. Went down yesterday in suburban Austin. Armstrong was on the run for 10 minutes before she was apprehended. Apparently, Caitlin ran around the parking lot of the doctor's office a bunch of times, like in circles before she crossed South 1st Street and was later apprehended about a mile away on Wilson Street. Now listen, Wilson Street, Mo Wilson, I don't know if I believe in a higher power, but damn, that's something, isn't it? You got, you got apprehended on Wilson Street. How does it make you feel? You're going to see Mo Wilson everywhere you go, Caitlin. So Caitlin Armstrong obviously pleaded not guilty. And uh, one of her attorneys, Rick Coffer, told the public that, listen, a lot of the information that's being put out into the media is just simply not accurate. He said, quote, All I can ask of the press here is that you not consider everything told to you by law enforcement as confirmed and reportable facts. Simply put, there's a lot more to the story that has yet been heard. End quote. Um, there's not, by the way. I, there's not at all. I don't know what the hell he was talking about. Maybe he didn't know the case well enough at that point. And maybe he was just like trying to be sensational and like, ooh, there's more to the story. Because I mean, based on what Rick Coffer said, you know, there's two sides to every story. Caitlin has something to say about her side that's going to make her look less guilty, right? Right? No, I, it, that never happened. So let's talk about the evidence found and how it was presented during the trial. And then we can talk about how hard it must have been to reach so far and so long in order to defend Caitlin Armstrong and find anything resembling reasonable doubt. That's just my opinion, allegedly. Don't come for me, but damn. I mean, it's, it's, it's a hard case to defend. I, I gotta give, I gotta give the defense team credit here. It is a hard case to defend. So for the prosecution, we have Ricky Jones. 
right? He's a badass. He takes no nonsense throughout this trial. He's kicking ass. He's taking names. He is not putting up with anything. And he's not an annoying lawyer. He's not like objecting every other sentence. But when he objects, he's like, objection. Mm -mm, Not today, judge. Not today. He's a very, he's a very compelling speaker. He's very charismatic. Now for the defense, we have two lawyers, uh, Jeffrey Purier and Rick Coffer. And we're really only going to hear from Rick Coffer because we're only going to go over closing statements. This trial was not publicized, just opening statements and closing statements were. And the defense argument of Jeffrey Purier and Rick Coffer is going to be basically, listen, you're going to hear a lot of circumstantial evidence but you won't hear any direct evidence that our client is responsible for the death of Mo Wilson because there isn't any. There isn't any. During his opening statements, Jeffrey Purier told jurors that Caitlin Armstrong was caught in a web of circumstantial evidence. And in reference to her fleeing to Costa Rica, he said, quote, she'd have no reason to know about any arrest warrant. You will hear Caitlin is passionate about traveling and passionate about yoga, end quote. What do you mean? Oh, what do you mean she'd have no reason to know about any arrest warrant? we're not I'm so confused she's guilty right she killed somebody so that's her reason for thinking that she might be arrested (laughs) that's her reason for thinking like I better get out of town because the police are on to me they have my black jeep in the area of the crime all right they're gonna do DNA they're gonna do fingerprints they're gonna They're going to dig deep. They're on to me now. I got to get the hell out of here. She doesn't need to know any inside information that an arrest is on its way. She knows it's coming because she knows what she did. She didn't travel to Costa Rica because she's passionate about traveling and passionate about yoga. She was escaping. She was running. Like, you will never convince me otherwise. And anybody who tries to convince you that she went to Costa Rica for any other reason than to get away with murder, they don't respect you. They don't respect your intelligence. So... When the prosecution played the surveillance videos of Caitlin's black jeep circling Cash's neighborhood like a hawk hunting for prey, Caitlin's lawyers were like, and? So what? That's Caitlin's jeep. But you know what you won't hear from any witnesses? You won't hear that they saw Caitlin commit this crime because they didn't. No one saw her commit this crime. So yeah, basically it's going to be like, I know Caitlin's car and cell phone was in the location of the murder. I know that Caitlin said she wanted to kill Mo Wilson. I know that she bought guns and I know that she had a motive to do it. But did anyone see her do it? Nope. Case closed. So we're going to go, you know, very, very briefly through the trial. On November 6th, after Colin Strickland had spent the day testifying, he got into it with some reporters outside the courthouse. News Nation reporter Alex Capriello reported, quote, when leaving the courthouse after his testimony today, key witness Colin Strickland goes out of his way to step on a photographer's foot. You can hear the photographer wail in pain. The photographer tells me he has pressed charges. This is his second negative interaction with Strickland today. Earlier, Colin tried to knock down his camera during lunch recess, end quote. Yeah, Strickland had an explosive moment, though, outside the courtroom, right, Alex? What happened? Yeah, in fact, I would say there were two explosive moments that happened. The first one, we weren't able to capture on the video. The second one, we did. With the first one, we saw Colin Strickland during the lunch recess actually take his arm and pull a camera uh, down from a photographer's hands. The photographer able to hold on to the camera, not let it drop to the ground. But then it was after his testimony, which is the video that we got right now, showing uh, Colin Strickland exiting the courthouse. Uh, Typically when this happens, the photographers surround trying to get video of the key witness. In this case, it's Colin Strickland. They were following him outside of the courtroom. When you see Colin Strickland actually change his path and stomp on one of the photographer's feet. You can hear that photographer actually wail in pain. He said that uh, it was rather painful for him. But really, this is just showing the type of state of mind, I suppose, Colin Strickland was in today, uh, lashing out at the people that were surrounding him, and in this case, uh, professional photographers. Oh, yeah, it was obvious. You see him step to his left right there. What do I have to say about Colin getting into it with reporters? Um, Does it mean he's violent and capable of murder, as some people have suggested? No. It means he's a very private person. It means he doesn't like being poked, prodded, and pushed. He's a dismissive avoidant. He likes to do his own thing. He doesn't like people looking too much at him. He doesn't like people asking him questions. He just wants to like be alone. And it was probably very overstimulating and annoying and like honestly like an assault to his senses. Not, I'm not saying he, what he did was right. I'm just saying that's probably how he felt. And it just became too much. Like 
a girl you probably really liked is dead. Your girlfriend killed her. You're getting a lot of hate online and everywhere, you know, rightly so. Um, no death threats or stuff. I'm not saying send Colin death threats, but I'm saying like if we feel towards him that he kind of didn't help the situation, that he could have been a better man, that's not wrong to feel. So he rightly should have gotten a little criticism. But he was like overwhelmed. He just felt like everyone's attacking me. Everyone's coming at me. I can't get a break. And he lashed out. I don't think it means he's capable of murder. I just think it means he's a little bit of a short fuse. I have often wondered how I would act if reporters were always in my face. You know, like, would I be gracious about it? Like Jennifer Garner? Or would I be like Britney Spears? And just like getting a baseball bat. Or was it a golf club? I think I'd be like Britney Spears. It would be very annoying to me. If like, especially when they're yelling at you, they're like following you with cameras. I would hate it. But anyways, the prosecution would present Caitlin Armstrong's digital footprint, which included her movements on the day and night of May 11th, which were tracked through her Jeep's infotainment system. From Caitlin's cell phone extraction, it showed that she viewed images of Mo on Instagram. There were multiple instances of Caitlin tracking Mo through the Strava app. Detective Richard Spittler of the Austin Police Department would show several email accounts connected to Caitlin that she'd used to purchase flights, she'd also gotten a prepaid visa card, and she had been using a VPN to hide her location. Detective Daniel Portnoy testified about the location points of Caitlin's Jeep on May 11th, and he had a handy little animation to illustrate for the jury and the rest of the courtroom. So at 7.35 p.m., Caitlin turned onto MLK Jr. Boulevard, then turned onto Cedar and Maple Avenue, traveling down Maple Avenue, which is where Caitlin Cash's apartment is. The Jeep stayed in this general area for about an hour, making several loops around the neighborhood. At 8.37 p.m., the Jeep was in the alley behind Maple. Remember, that's where the location to Caitlin Cash's apartment is located in that alley. And at 8.40 p.m., the vehicle was located in a grassy parking area near the Maple Avenue alley. Portnoy also said that Caitlin's cell phone had been turned off from 7.30 p.m. to 9.47 p.m. So Caitlin turned off her cell phone, okay? Turned it off from 7.30 to 9.47 p.m. during the time period that she's stalking Colin and Mo Wilson. And Caitlin thinks, like, if my cell phone's off, they can't track me. But she doesn't realize that her Jeep's infotainment system is still tracking her movements. There was a forensic investigator, Pamela Mazak. She put together a comprehensive timeline of where the cell phones of Colin, Caitlin, and Mo Wilson were on May 11th. Caitlin was at the house for most of the day before she left and went to the South Lamar area around 6.30. That's when she called Colin, but he didn't answer. Data from Caitlin's Jeep shows that the car was turned off at 8.45 p.m. just around the corner from Caitlin Cash's apartment. And phone data showed Colin Strickland traveling home at 8.37 p.m. Around 9.15, the gunshots rang out through the night. These were the gunshots that ended Mo's life. And at 9.17 p.m., Caitlin's Jeep was turned back on and it started driving again. At 9.43 p.m., it stopped at a dumpster for three minutes before continuing home. And her phone was turned back on again when she arrived home a few minutes later. Okay? This tells me everything I need to know, but, you know whatever. Under cross-examination by the defense, Pamela Mazak said, yeah, you know, I can't say for sure that it was Caitlin Armstrong driving the Jeep at this time, but I do know it wasn't Colin Strickland because his cell phone was on the move. And there's evidence of Colin um, either being on his motorcycle or at Pullberger more than once while the black Jeep was actively driving around. So we know that Colin was not in this Jeep. Although during the trial, Caitlin's defense team is going to kind of make it seem like Colin could have possibly been involved, but like, how? They never actually put any proof forward. They never actually put forth a fully fledged, fully fleshed out theory on how Colin was involved. They just sort of allude to it, you know, just enough to try to make people and the jury be like, well, maybe Colin, you know, but they don't like actually ever say anything of any substance. On cross-exam, the defense asked Detective Spittler, Like, why didn't you go through Colin Strickland's laptop? Why did you only take Caitlin Armstrong's electronics? Why did you not feel like Colin Strickland's laptop should have been looked through? Why didn't you do a rape kit on Mo Wilson's body after her death? And Detective Spittler was like, well, I mean, first of all, there's no sign of sexual assault for the rape kit. And secondly, you know, we had talked to Colin and what he said checked out. We knew that he wasn't near the scene of the crime at at the time of the crime. So why would I be treating him as a suspect at this point? You know, our suspect was Caitlin Armstrong, 
we were at that point funneling our resources into looking into her. Now, the prosecution also called in Stephen Aston. Stephen Aston is a firearms and tool mark expert, and he would tell the jury that every firearm has its own unique fingerprint, which is caused by the grooves and the cuts inside of the barrel. So when a bullet is shot, it heats up. Whatever kind of imperfections are inside of the barrel are going to cause cuts and grooves that match on the bullet. And pretty much every gun is gonna be a little bit different based on like the groove marks and things. So when Caitlin's nine millimeter Sig Sauer was test shot, Aston reached the conclusion that the projectiles found in Caitlin Cash's apartment, the ones that killed Mo Wilson, they were most likely fired from Caitlin's gun. He said there was a high probability of it. He also said, listen, yes, this is not a perfect science, but the marks were very, 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 very similar. On cross-examination, Caitlin's defense team tried to poke holes in Steve Aston's testimony and in his credentials, and then the defense brought out Bill Tobin. Bill Tobin is allegedly an expert in metallurgy, and this is just like the study of metal and how to like manufacture it and produce it and its different elements and things. And Bill Tobin was asked if firearm identification was a science, to which he responded no. He said, quote, the critical component is 100% subjective. There is no direct, quantifiable, or quantitative guidance as to what they should be looking for, end quote. A lot of big words, but it's like Steve Aston said the same thing. Why did you have to pay another expert to come and say the exact same thing? Steve Aston admitted, like, no, this is not a perfect science. You know, it's like fingerprint science. It's not a perfect science. It relies on us looking and, and matching these things up. But these bullets that killed Mo Wilson and Caitlin's gun have very, very, very similar marks. And there's a high likelihood that, you know, the bullets came from her gun. Now, when the state cross-examined Bill Tobin, he admitted that he hadn't actually seen any evidence related to the case. Basically, like, he hadn't even looked at the bullets and the, the casings and the marks that were made from what was allegedly Caitlin's gun. He didn't even look to compare to see if he believed that they were close or that they were very similar. And he also said he was not a member of the American Academy of Forensic Sciences. He also admitted that he was being paid by the defense for his expert testimony. And he acknowledged that firearms and tool mark identification is a valid investigation tool. He just said, listen, it shouldn't be used to prove guilt or innocence, which is fine because we're not just using this ballistics evidence to prove Caitlin's guilt or innocence. It's just one of the many pieces of the puzzle that all form together to show that she's the only one who could have done this. Basically, the state is trying to prove that the bullets that shot Mo Wilson came from Caitlin's gun, or they're trying to at least say like they were similar. But the defense is saying the state can't 100% prove that. Firearm tool mark analysis is currently a subjective process that relies on the skill and expertise of the examiner. Which, yes, I agree, but for a long time, so was the comparison of human fingerprints. And, and we still use that in a legal basis. And it's not as if, like I said, the whole case lives and dies by the ballistics. Steve Aston never said, he never said that the bullet casings matched perfectly. He told the jurors that he saw a positive level of agreement between the bullets and the casings left at the scene to those test fired in the lab using Caitlin's 9mm Sig Sauer. Two DNA analysts were also called to the stand, Alexandra Gill and Samantha Perkins. Gill said that she prepared the samples. Basically, she lifted the DNA and the fingerprints and stuff, and then she gave them to Samantha Perkins for the analysis. Samantha Perkins testified that through the analysis she performed, she concluded that DNA found on the handlebars of Mo Wilson's bike had Moe's DNA, as well as Kaylin Armstrong's DNA, along with a third unrelated unidentified person. Colin Strickland's DNA was not found on the bike. Caitlin Cash's DNA was not found on the bike. And on the seat of Moe's bike, three DNA profiles were also found, including Moe Wilson's, along with a profile that strongly suggested Caitlin Armstrong was one of the contributors. It was something like one in like billions and under cross-examination by the defense, Samantha Perkins testified that she couldn't say how the DNA got on the bike, just that it was there, right? Because Caitlin's attorneys are going to be like, well, you don't know if Caitlin put the DNA there, right? They're going to suggest that Caitlin Armstrong's DNA could have gotten on Mo Wilson's bike through Colin Strickland, right? So Colin touched Caitlin, and then Colin was on his motorcycle with Mo, and then he got on Mo's bike, and then he put Caitlin's DNA on Mo's bike. 
And that's how Caitlin's DNA got there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, and, and listen, Samantha Perkins is going to testify and be like, I mean, that's possible. You know, there's DNA transfer, there's touch DNA. It's very possible, I suppose. Not very possible, but it is possible. Just because something's possible doesn't mean that it is probable. Next, we have fingerprint evidence, right? And this fingerprint evidence was kind of a mess. The defense called its first witness, and that was senior latent fingerprint expert with the Austin Forensic Science Department, Aaron Legron. Now, you might think the Austin Forensic Science Department is affiliated with the Austin Police Department. They used to be. Now they're a separate entity. So the defense was able to call Erin Legrone and she said that she'd run an automatic fingerprint identification system search and compared that with the prints found at the scene. There were 22 latent prints lifted from areas around the doors and windows of Caitlin Cash's apartment and nine lifted from Moe's bike. According to Legrone, Detective Spittler only requested that she compare the prints to Caitlin Armstrong, no one else. And the results showed that the prints were either not suitable for comparison, they were inconclusive, or excluded as Caitlin Armstrong's fingerprints. The state pointed out that as far as the inconclusive prints, they were not ruled out as belonging to Armstrong. They just didn't have good enough information to use them to exclude or include her. There was actually some matching with the fingerprints, but they said it wasn't like a full print, and so they couldn't specifically say. But the thing that I think a lot of people don't understand, which I personally had to learn through my partner on the podcast, Derek Lavasser, on Crime Weekly Podcast, Fingerprints aren't like as easy as everybody thinks. It's not just like you touch something and then, oh, there's this like perfect fingerprint that we can match. Usually the fingerprints are like um, messy. They're not completely full. They're partial prints or um, they didn't stick well enough to the surface. Fingerprints are, are very difficult. When you have a good fingerprint to compare to somebody's actual fingerprint, yeah, it's, it's a great science to use, but otherwise it's pretty much just like hit or miss. All right, so let's go to closing arguments and examine the points made by each side. Here is Ricky Jones for the prosecution, addressing the fact that the defense team was essentially trying to blame the Austin Police Department for focusing on Caitlin and not giving credence to the possibility that it could have been someone else who killed Mo Wilson. And Ricky here is gonna be like, that's stupid. He's basically just going to be like, come on, guys. Come on. They asked Steve Aston several times, why did you not exclude all other guns in the world? No one else in the world had a six-hour P65, P365 and left their DNA at the scene. Nobody else in the world fit that description. No one else in the world was angry that their boyfriend was out with Mo Wilson. Just her. No one else in the world had their Jeep circling 1708B Maple for an hour before you heard that 915 shot. No one else in the world matched that description. That's what you do when you got nothing. You pick on the detective and you talk to him about where you didn't look. Not the mountain of evidence that we have. You try to distract you from that. And finally, no one else in the world left the scene of the murder in Caitlin Armstrong's Jeep that was parked in that alley from 8.40 p.m., two minutes after the murder. We don't need no one else in the world to make these facts that came from that chair true. These are not my words. These are facts that came from the witness chair. No one else in the world fits this criteria. So that, did you check every gun in the world? That's called a rabbit hole they want you to go down. Only Kaylin Armstrong, the defendant, fits these facts that was presented to you through that witness chair. Now, initially, when those video people came about, you remember the cross-examination? Do you know how many black Jeeps in Austin? Do you know how many black Jeeps in the neighborhood? How do you know it's that black Jeep? How do you know it's a Jeep? Aren't there a lot of black SUVs? The minute Daniel Portner comes up and takes that GPS out of her Jeep, and we see her at CarMax in her Jeep, now they switch gears to how do you know she was driving her Jeep? You see the rabbit holes they're going to try to send you down? First it wasn't her Jeep. Then we got proof that it was her Jeep. And now she wasn't driving the Jeep. Now, I want you to look at your picture on the screen and think about one thing. At 917, track 100 of that Jeep, two minutes after that murder, just a few feet down that alley. Track 100 starts at 917. Now, this is not a true picture of 9.55 p.m. that night. I just want to show you this because... You see Colin Strickland in that, in that uh, garage right there? 
That's exactly where he said he was at 9.55 p.m. or somewhere around that time when Caitlin Armstrong, the defendant, drove up from murdering Mo Wilson in that black Jeep. The same black Jeep that from our first 10 witnesses wasn't a black Jeep, wasn't her Jeep. And then the second set of witnesses, she wasn't in the Jeep. That same black Jeep that she was not in drove up. And like Colin testified, he was in the driveway with the garage up when she showed up at 9.55. That takes away all these phantom people. You remember all that talk about how many people went to the house for this, that, and the other? Rabbit hole. Did you hear any testimony that anybody was driving that black Jeep, her black Jeep, with her phone? They came back and made her say, Caitlin's phone, not Caitlin with her phone. To imply that someone may have stolen her Jeep, stolen her phone, and the geo location put them in the same place. So whoever stole her Jeep and stole her phone, they was running side by side. But check this out. Whoever stole her phone and was in her Jeep sent somebody a text message with her home address from that phone that they stole that was not in her possession, if you believe that. And that same person who had Caitlin Armstrong, the defendant's phone, sent Colin Strickland a text message about a lawsuit that they had going on with some real estate issues. So if she didn't have her phone, whoever stole her Jeep from her phone was also interested in her lawsuit and where she lived, if you believe that. And there's no evidence to suggest that it was anybody other than her. That same phone says she had to run errands earlier, and she texted Colin saying Feeney, which I think means finished. So whoever had her phone, if it wasn't her, they were finished running their errands just like she was. See, the more I talk, the more ridiculous it gets that it wasn't her with that Jeep and that phone. Now, they talked about Pam Mazak. That GPS, as a three or four times, is GPS more accurate than CDR data? She said yes. Now, remember when Portnoy was there, they kept talking about how GPS wasn't that accurate. <laughs> Two days later, Mazak get there. Now, GPS is more accurate than CDR, isn't it? We agree. It's accurate because it puts her Jeep at the scene, puts it at 840, has it leaving about 917, and has it driving up at a home at 950. Her Jeep, her GPS, pulled out of her car at CarMax, and the DNA on the bike puts her at the scene. Proof that Caitlin was there when Mo Wilson was shot. Gunshots at 915. Jeep parked in the alley, leaves after the gunshots. Caitlin's DNA on the bike. Shell casings that matched the gun. And like Detective Ramirez said, it was personal. So she shot her in the heart as she's all on the ground based on the exit of that bullet. Now, when the defense expert got up there, he said three times. And I'm like, whoa. DNA tells us who was there. I agree. <laughs> That's their expert, not ours. <laughs> Our expert was more cautious talking about the ratio. He said DNS tells us who was there. <laughs> and I agree. She was there. Then she runs to Costa Rica, had plastic surgery, on the beach teaching yoga while the Wilsons are trying to pick up the pieces. The state has met its burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. I think we climbed past that mountain and climbed Mount Everest. Overwhelming. Get your notepad. Write a line down the middle of it. If you don't have a notepad, use a notepad in your brain. And when they get up here, do something for me, but do it for Mo. When they say something and sing it out a rabbit hole, write it on the left side. If it's proven from the evidence chair, pursuant to paragraph 12 of your charge, write it on the right side of your paper. And we've been here a long time, but we ain't got to stay much longer because when you get to the back, I submit you that when you separate the left side of the paper from the right side of the paper, it's going to be blank. And we can get out here pretty quickly and find her guilty of shooting Mo Wilson in the heart and in the head and taking away this prodigy at the age of 25. So basically, Ricky Jones is saying all of this evidence points to one possible outcome. And whatever rabbit holes the defense tries to send you down, don't let them. Focus on what can be proven. Don't let the what if isms slow you down from reaching the correct verdict. And then the defense team came in and gave one of the weirdest, most reaching closing statements I have yet to witness. So this is Rick Coffer. He's Caitlin's lawyer, one of Caitlin's lawyers. One year 
four months and 12 days. That is how long Caitlin Armstrong has asserted her innocence. And from day one, she asked for this trial. She asked for you to hear this case. You have all done extraordinary work. This is a difficult case. It is an emotional case. It could appear to be an easy case. For those one year, four months, and 12 days, Caitlin Armstrong has been trapped in a nightmare of circumstantial evidence. How do you go about disproving a negative? The government has presented you the government's case to meet the government's burden. There is a lot of system. There's not much stake. It's a case based on assumptions, it's based on confirmation bias, and a lack of direct evidence. So yeah, as expected, he's like, there's a lot of sizzle, a lot of sizzle in this case, but not much stake, which like, as soon as he said that, I was like, I hate you. I hate, I hate everything about you. Why would you say that? That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Uh, but yeah, he's like, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence. There's not a lot of direct evidence, although I would say DNA, Caitlin's DNA on Mo Wilson's bike well, might be considered direct evidence, but okay, whatever. Let us talk about the case against Caitlin Armstrong. It starts with jealousy. Jealousy is suspicion of someone's unfaithfulness in a relationship. And jealousy is a type of insecurity. We know that Colin Strickland fostered insecurity, and he has become the new poster child for Peter Pan syndrome in Austin, Texas. So what is the evidence that Caitlin Armstrong is a jealous psycho? Colin was not honest with Caitlin about his special friend in Colorado, and Caitlin allegedly sent him a photograph of that friend. The implication being, number one, Perhaps she had been looking at his phone. And number two, that she's crazy and jealous because when he was sneaking off to Colorado to meet up with the person sending him inappropriate photographs, she had the temerity to not like it. Caitlin called Mariah Wilson once in October 2021. The text messages introduced into evidence show you that she had immediately before been in conversation through those messages with Colin about the location of her helmet. Probably it wasn't a phone call about the helmet. Let's be real. Probably it was a phone call, something to the extent of, by the by, Colin Strickland is a little bit of an ass, and I live with him. Is that so unreasonable? Is that insane? <laughs> Caitlin also had the chutzpah to send Colin a snarky text message. When there was an Instagram story of Colin in a photograph with Mariah Wilson, undisputed, Caitlin texted, Give my regards to Mo. That doesn't make a murderer. It's possible that Caitlin viewed Colin's text messages. Undoubtedly. Just as Colin testified from the witness stand that Colin had done the exact same thing in past relationships. You 14, and the 12 of you who will decide this case, are a relatively unique species in Travis County. You are a diverse jury. You are a diverse jury of age, of gender, of experiences, and of race. That is uncommon in this county. Rick Coffer sort of started with kissing the jury's ass, which is a usual defense attorney tactic when they don't have anything else. And he's like, you are sitting here, an unusual jury for Austin, Texas, a diverse jury with diverse opinions. And I know you will do the right thing. And he says, this is an emotional case, but it's also a difficult case that could appear to be an easy case, which is, to me, that's a word salad. But I, I don't think that the case is that difficult, right? Because the defense has never posed an alternate theory about what had happened to Mo Wilson. And it is true, the state has the burden of proof and the defense doesn't have to come up with an alternate theory, but it really wouldn't hurt if you had one that made sense, right? And when defense teams do have an alternate theory that makes sense, they use it. They use it as part of their defense. So he's never going to touch on an alternate theory. He's just going to sort of allude to one, which is one of the reasons I know he has nothing. I want you to bring that diversity of life experience into your deliberations. I want you to look out at this assembled audience. 
And I want you to wonder, because generations are different. This morning, someone advised me of a, a new app the kids are on, Flip. I hadn't heard of it until this morning. Young people communicate a little bit differently. But I would bet you every penny that I am worth that at least one of you has looked at your partner's text messages at some point. And I would bet you everything that I'm worth and him that that's true of a number of the people that are in this audience. And the younger they are, the more common it is. Because jealousy is a fundamentally human emotion. Because it is about lack of trust in a relationship. Honestly, I feel like this whole portion of this guy's closing statement is kind of a waste of time because, listen, it's not a crime to be jealous. No one is mad at Caitlin Armstrong for being jealous. It's not illegal to be jealous. However, it is illegal to murder someone because of your jealousy. But Rick Coffer is going to try and convince us that Caitlin wasn't jealous of Mo Wilson. She wasn't jealous of her at all, you know. She was totally chill, totally laid back. There's no signs of jealousy. We know what Mr. Strickland shared with us about Caitlin Armstrong. That in October of 2021, when Colin Strickland was having his short relationship with Mariah Wilson, that Caitlin Armstrong was on dating apps. That Caitlin Armstrong was dating other people. We know that Colin Strickland told you that at the Cyclocross events in Benville, Arkansas, in January of 2022, that Caitlin didn't appear to him jealous in any way. Nothing remarkable about her behavior to him. And in fact, we know that he shared that, yes, he'd had a long-standing sexual relationship with professional cyclist and woman, Amity Rockwell, and that Caitlin was friends with Amity Rockwell, that Caitlin had never expressed anything approaching jealousy or negative emotions about Amity Rockwell. Mariah Wilson was not the first cycling woman in Colin's life. So, first of all, all of us women know, or I'm sure many of us know, that if your man has a girl he's friends with, who he may have been romantic with in the past, you keep her close, right? You don't talk shit about her, you don't make her an enemy, you keep her close. Just because Caitlyn was friendly with this other woman and didn't act outwardly jealous about her in front of Colin does not mean that she wasn't threatened by her, it doesn't mean that... Caitlyn was genuinely friends with this other woman. We heard from Caitlyn's own friends. They said she was so jealous of Mo Wilson that she wanted to kill her. But go off, King. Go off. Tell us about how unjealous Caitlyn was, about how secure she was, about how there's no evidence that she was the jealous type. So now this this guy here, uh, what's his name, Rick Hoffer, he's going to keep talking about Colin, what Colin did, why Colin is to blame, why Colin was a bad boyfriend, as if any of this is relevant or has a point. Besides to make you empathize with Caitlyn for being in love with an emotionally unavailable fuckboy, which total empathy here. I do have empathy for that. That sucks. But I have no empathy in what she did and how she lashed out towards Mo Wilson because of her relationship with Colin. A relationship she clearly wasn't happy in, that she wasn't being fulfilled in, but she was trying to hold on to at all costs. Colin hid his relationship with Mariah Wilson into 2022. He did that because he didn't want to be honest about it. He doesn't like emotions. He likes what he wants and what's important to him. He was breadcrumbing. I think you know what that is. He was leaving his options open. He just didn't want to get caught. He didn't lie because Caitlin was a jealous psycho killer. He lied because that's how he approaches life. That's how he approaches women. He's a professional cyclist and an amateur liar. Well, what did Colin Strickland say about Caitlin, though? He said the relationship was not volatile. Caitlin was not a particularly jealous girlfriend. He shared he'd had girlfriends in the past, before Caitlyn, and that Caitlyn was not jealous like those other past girlfriends. Who brought up jealousy first? Austin Police Department Detective Richard Spittler. On May 12th, mere 12 hours after the murder of Mariah Wilson, when Detective Spittler interviewed Colin Strickland, who first said, that J word, Richard Spittler, because it was a great theory. And what a convenient narrative. What a wonderful and easy way to paint a woman and to tell a story. 
the woman scorn. Whether the facts met the narrative or not, it's a great story. The truth of the matter is that Caitlin's emotions and her actions were normal and routine and human. But she had to be portrayed as a jealous psycho to create the motive. The problem, however, in Colin and Caitlin's relationship was not Mariah Wilson. The problem was always Colin Strickland. However, Colin's behavior does not make sense. Colin changed Mariah Wilson's name in his phone on May 11th. Colin deleted his text exchange with Mariah Wilson on May 11th. What was different about May 11th? Why did he do that on May 11th? He felt he needed an alibi. Why that day? Jealousy. So Rick Coffer is going to try to use Detective Richard Spittler of the Austin Police Department as a scapegoat. And he's going to try to bring all of this to Spittler and Colin Strickland. And let me say, I don't think that Colin wanted to admit to the police how jealous Caitlin was because then it would look bad for him. It would look as if he'd continued a relationship with Mo in the face of that relationship with Mo destroying his relationship with Caitlin and driving Caitlin to the point where she would consider murder as a solution. The girl was clearly jealous, okay? Caitlin was clearly jealous of Mo Wilson and there's no shame in her game. I'm not judging her for being jealous. Trying to prove that Caitlin wasn't the jealous type after seeing her stalk Colin's social media accounts, follow him around Austin. That's not the move for this defense team, right? You need to prove that she didn't murder Mo Wilson because of the jealousy or for any other reason. But they can't really do that. So they're just continuing to focus on Caitlin wasn't jealous. She was completely secure. If she did anything or felt anything, it was because Colin drove her crazy. Colin drove her to this. But what about the black Jeep? You know exactly where and exactly when that Jeep traveled. There is not a doubt that Caitlin's cell phone was on her person between about 5.30 p.m. and at least 7.30 p.m. on May 11th. There's no dispute whatsoever as to that. And there is no doubt of any type that Caitlin's cell phone was in the vicinity of the black Jeep. Was Caitlin in the black Jeep? Who had access to the black Jeep? Who had access to the key fob to the black Jeep? Who had access to the key bowl containing that fob that drives the black Jeep? Who previously owned a black SUV? Pam Mazak presented you a compelling PowerPoint. Animation details. PowerPoint presentations in criminal cases like this are a lot like swimsuits. What they reveal is interesting. What they hide is what's essential. It's real easy to look at the animation that Pam Mazak provided you and see Dot, 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 call detail record time, <coughs> dot, 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 dot. And then to see infotainment track log, dot, dot, dot. And if you don't review the data, if you take it on the word of a PowerPoint animation, it's really easy to look at it and go, the phone was in the car and it was riding together. There is a very, very good reason that you were shown a PowerPoint and that you were not presented the data. When you return to the room back there to deliberate, ask for the PowerPoint, ask for the actual data. The problem isn't the data in your heads. The problem is the presentation of it. Because what you'll see if you actually look at the data is that you were left with an impression that is not true. Look at the timestamp on the call detail records compared to the infotainment, and you're going to see a lag. And sometimes you'll see an advancement. And what you'll see is that while it is undisputed 
that the phone was in the vicinity of the black sheet, you'll see that there is zero conclusive evidence that phone actually was in the black sheet. What you will see, though, is some really peculiar movement of the black sheet. Peculiar movement that Pam Mazak completely skipped over. When that vehicle is heading northbound on Lamar and stops near an area called Spa 7, where maybe somebody had an appointment, or maybe not, you're going to see some very strange movement of the data within a parking garage. And you might wonder why that car may have gone up and down inside a parking garage, and why when the car is moving inside a parking garage, the phone is not in that parking garage. The phone is inside of a building. So I don't really understand what Rick Hoffer is doing here. Did Caitlin have an appointment in a building near Caitlin Cash's apartment? He said, maybe, maybe not. If Caitlin was in a building at the time, what building was it? Why was she there? If Caitlin has an alibi, if Caitlin was in a place other than Caitlin Cash's apartment shooting Mo Wilson three times, don't you think her defense team should provide that as exculpatory evidence? What about all those other vehicles? What about Colin's mom's car? What about the Mercedes? What about the trucks? What about the half dozen odd vehicles? Did Kaylin Armstrong have access to vehicles that weren't the black Jeep? Absolutely. Did she drive vehicles that weren't the black Jeep? Absolutely. But wait, Rick Hofer. Colin said, I saw her get out of the black Jeep. But that's not what he said. The first time he testified in front of you, a few weeks ago, it was a Friday. He said that, that's what I believe. He was real hesitant. He wasn't, he wasn't rock solid. They had a weekend to think. And he came back and he continued to testify in front of you on Monday. And somehow his memory and recollection of every detail in this case had become fuzzier between Friday and Monday over the weekend, except for his opinion about seeing Caitlyn come out of a black Jeep. And as far as whether Colin saw Caitlyn drive home in the black Jeep on the evening of May 11th, it really doesn't matter because we know she did, right? Because the GPS on her SUV shows that she did. It shows Caitlyn's Jeep traveling from the scene of the crime, stopped at a dumpster. We don't know what happened there. They never talk about during the trial, I'm assuming because that dumpster got emptied out, went to the landfill, they couldn't find anything. She goes to a dumpster really quick, then goes home, and then her phone is turned on like as soon as she pulls into the driveway, okay? Her phone is turned on as soon as the Jeep pulls into the driveway. So these are a lot of like what he's calling circumstantial evidence. These are a lot of coincidences that are just not possible to be happening if she's completely innocent. Colin bought those guns. Colin told her to train with the gun. And she did. Once. And she was totally normal. I asked the witness, Jill, did Caitlin seem all murdery? No. Now the prosecution led with a video of her at the gun range. Raise your hand in the audience uh, if you've ever been to a gun range or ever held a firearm. Did you kill anyone? It's emotional, it's compelling, but that's a rabbit hole. That's a smoke screen. Once again, this is really dumb. It's a dumb argument because we aren't just looking at Caitlin at the shooting range, right? We're not like, oh, she went to the shooting and he said she only did it once or something. No, she was there more than once. She even um, got together with a neighbor of her sister's who was who gave them like gun safety classes and brought them to the range to practice and things like Caitlin was definitely practicing with that gun in the months leading up to Mel Wilson's murder. But we aren't just looking at that. We're looking at her location that night. We're looking at the ammunition she bought at the range. The way she ran out of the country after talking to the police about Mo's murder. We're looking at a totality of evidence. And to randomly pluck one tiny piece of that evidence out and then call it a rabbit hole and a smoke screen, it's just stupid. It's stupid and it shows me that Rick Coffer certainly doesn't respect the jury and their diverse intelligence as much as he claimed to. But Rick, what about the DNA, Rick? Caitlin cannot be excluded as a potential contributor to a DNA swab for Mariah Wilson's bike, period, full stop. A swab from the handlebars and from the seat of that bike. 
I am no DNA expert. None of y'all are either. We heard from several of them. I don't know. I know that there's transfer DNA. I know that there can be lab contamination. I know that there was a lot of conversation about helmets and who wore what helmet and when they wore it. And if we know who wore the helmet when and this and that. Or did Colin put on a black motorcycle jacket as he discussed with Richard Spittler uh, on the way from Caitlin Cash's apartment to Deep Eddie and Poolberger? Would that black jacket have his DNA? And then if Mariah would, with Caitlin and the, I don't know, you will make of that what you will. But the upshot is this. There are two realities. Schrodinger's cat. <coughs> Either uh, Caitlin Armstrong was there, uh, and that's why there's DNA uh, that was found on that bike, or at least that she cannot be excluded, blah, blah, blah. Uh, or uh, a person wearing gloves had their hands on a driving steering wheel that had Caitlin's DNA. Or Mariah Wilson had touched the same bike. Same helmet or the black jacket. I don't know. But I do know one thing. Every person that handled this bike handled it in the same way. It was arm day at the gym this morning, and this is still really easy because this is how you pick up this bike. But what the government and the police would like you to believe is that after a brutal slang, that the, that the way, and see how this tire is arranged, that the way then, you know, Caitlin Armstrong would have, I guess, wanted to hold the bike like this, that does not make sense. Everyone held it this way. And what's astounding, and this is what you heard from the APD expert, right here, on this portion of the bike frame, this was the area not swapped for DNA. Why not? It was more appropriate for latent prints. Could you swap for DNA? Absolutely. Why didn't you? It was more appropriate for latent prints. No DNA here. Okay, we've heard enough from Mr. Coffer for now, so I'll summarize his arguments for you. Basically, he's saying there's no motive for jealousy. There was no motive for jealousy until Austin Police Detective Rick Spittler fabricated it out of thin air, just pulled it out of his rear end with no valid reason for feeling that way, right? Rick Coffer's holding the bike in the courtroom, and he's saying, here, this is how you hold a bike. Why wasn't this area swapped for DNA? And he's talking about the bike bar, you know, that kind of connects, I don't know how, I don't know the anatomy of a bike, but it's like, the seat of the bike and the bar that kind of like goes down to like a, a pole that holds the handlebars. I don't know. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'll put a picture up. But he's saying, why wasn't this area swapped for DNA? It was just, uh, you know, fingerprinted. Well, to be honest, and this is never explicitly stated, but once again, something I learned from Derek was certain materials, certain surfaces are better for DNA swabs than others handlebars, a bike seat, for instance. These are made out of softer, more porous materials. They're more likely to hold DNA than, say, the slick metal of a bike bar. That slick metal of a bike bar would be better for fingerprinting and not so good for DNA, right? But Coffer's not going to tell you that. He's just going to be like, oh, it's suspicious that they didn't swap this area for DNA because this is where you would hold the bike. Not even necessarily, by the way, okay? Because if what Colin is saying is true, which we have no reason to believe that it's not, that Moe's bike was sitting outside of Caitlin Cash's apartment, but then it's found in the bamboo forest like 30 feet away. When Caitlin left after shooting Mo Wilson, she hopped on that bike and rode it a little bit, right? So you wouldn't grab the bike bar to do that. You would just hop on. You'd grab the handlebars. You'd mount the bike. You'd start riding. And then maybe when she threw it, she would have grabbed the bike bar, but not necessarily. She could have just like picked it up by the wheels. These are very light bikes. She could have just kind of got off and like kicked it into the bamboo. Like We don't know what she did. We don't know if she held it that way. Maybe he's saying that somebody else's DNA might be on the bike who did hold the bike, but what would that matter? Because 
what if somebody else had had held the bike? What if somebody had helped Mo load the bike onto her car? Their DNA is on there. You know, it, it doesn't really matter. Rick Coffer also talked about the fact that there was unknown DNA profiles on Mo's bike and on Caitlin's Sig Sauer, the gun, but the Austin Police Department ignored all of this because they didn't want any evidence presented that would not fit with their narrative. And actually, we are going to go back to Rick Coffer's closing statements because they get pretty reachy towards the end. For example, he claims that the Austin Police Department gave Colin Strickland a wide berth. They never focused on him. They never even looked at his laptop. And I mean, why would they have to? As Detective Spittler said, he wasn't the suspect at that point. And if they really wanted to know what was on Colin's laptop, they could have just asked Caitlin Armstrong because she probably memorized the complete contents of Colin's laptop because she was all over that thing. And that's another thing, right? Caitlin and Colin are using this laptop. In fact, Caitlin's going to be using the laptop more than Colin is because she's the business manager. She's answering the emails. She's doing the deals. She's the one using it more often. So that is a good question to ask Detective Spittler. Caitlin used Colin's laptop. Why didn't you take Colin's laptop? But I wouldn't ask Detective Spittler, like, why didn't you take Colin's laptop? Because he could potentially be a suspect. Colin was not a suspect in this. It was proven that he was at home at the time that the murder took place by GPS on his phone. He talked to somebody on the phone while he was there fumbling around his garage for bike parts. Okay, it's it's not possible that Colin would have been a suspect at that point, especially with the presence of Caitlin as a much stronger suspect. But Rick Coffer wants the jury to feel like, oh, they just completely overlooked Colin and he is a potential suspect. But they're not telling us why he's a potential suspect because he's not. Coffer said that Colin was given special treatment. He wasn't looked at as a potential suspect, which is clearly not true because he was the first suspect. That's why the police went straight to him the day following Mo's murder before they even knew who Caitlin Armstrong was. But when they figured out that the black Jeep was Caitlin's vehicle and she'd been driving it on May 11th and when they got phone calls from Caitlin's own friend saying, hey, we heard Mo Wilson is dead. And by the way, Caitlin Armstrong said she was going to get a gun and she wanted to kill Mo for going after Colin. So just so you guys know, two friends of Caitlin's felt compelled to call the police and tell them this after Mo Wilson died. Two of them. So... So after the police saw all of this, they, like any other logical, reasonably minded people, said, oh, hey, this actually makes more sense, right? Not only that, but like I said, they were able to prove that Colin was at home at the time of the murder, nowhere near the scene of the crime. Unlike Caitlin and her Jeep. And then Coffer goes off on a tangent about the patriarchy. Like, I shit you not. Isn't that where, where we're at, that circumstantial evidence case? It's a simple case. It's an easy story it's a beautifully simple story but it's wrong and it's based on assumptions of gender and of motive and a bias toward confirmation and who got to investigate this richard spittler on his first homicide so what happened here police think caitlin committed this crime they don't know she fits their story. She fits the story they created. A spurned, jealous lover. That story is so easy. That story is so easy to tell because it ties into a framework of patriarchy and misogyny that is rooted in American culture. Oh, and during the opening statements, the legal team was like, oh, Caitlin just loves traveling. She loves yoga. She loves traveling. Coffer even said it in his own closing statement. But then at the end of the closing statement, he's like, Caitlin ran to Costa Rica and changed her appearance, not because she was running from murder charges, but because she was scared. She she probably thought that Colin had killed Mo, and so she was afraid of him. Like, that's why she ran. That's why she changed her appearance. And Rick Coffer says this in a very condescending, prickish way, like, Um, yeah, she was scared. Like, doesn't that make sense? Because, yeah, Colin Strickland's going on a killing spree. He's going to kill Mo Wilson after he's the known last person to be with her before she died. And now he's going to kill Caitlin Armstrong, his girlfriend. She's next, right? That, That makes absolute sense that Caitlin would be afraid of that and she'd flee to Costa Rica and get plastic surgery. Colin's going to follow her to Costa Rica. You know, it's a movie. He wants to kill her so bad, he's going to track her down, figure out where she's at in Costa Rica, find her and kill her. And the only way she can prevent that from happening is if she gets plastic surgery so he can't recognize her when he chases her and tracks her to Costa Rica like some bounty hunter. The fact is, 
The police never know what happened, right? They're called to a crime. They collect evidence. They talk to people. They start putting the pieces together to build a case against the most likely suspect. And I think we can all agree objectively that in this case, Caitlin Armstrong is the most likely suspect. Means, motive, opportunity. She had all three. It's not law enforcement's job to know what happened. It's their job to collect evidence, give it to the district attorney's office, who then brings the evidence to trial, where a jury of Caitlin's peers decide whether or not that evidence was compelling enough to find her guilty. And guess what? They thought it was. In under two hours, the jury found Caitlin Armstrong guilty of the murder of Mo Wilson. She was sentenced to 90 years in prison with a chance of parole after 30 years. But that's not all, folks. There's more because Caitlin Armstrong can't just take her medicine and fade to black. Caitlin's attorneys have filed an appeal already, so we'll have to wait and see what happens next because the reason for that appeal has yet to be revealed. Basically, usually they'll say like, oh, we're appealing because she had poor counsel or we're appealing because um, the prosecution withheld evidence, et cetera, et cetera. They'll say why they're appealing. They haven't yet um, as of last night or like one o'clock this morning when I last checked. So they haven't yet. So we'll wait and see. But I really want to know what you think about this case. Let me know in the comment section, but wait, don't go anywhere because before we wrap up for the day, we got to hit up Stephanie Small Business Showcase. We got to do it. Stephanie Small Business Showcase. Woohoo! And today's small business comes to us from Ariana, who's owner of Rainbow Goth. Ariana says that she's always used art to work through difficult times to express herself. She says she has bipolar. She spent so much of her life battling between her mania and her depression and art and creating art has really pulled her through both of these periods. Rainbow Goth is a marriage of both sides of her personality. Dark and twisty meets vibrant and bright. And that explanation, um, the way she described it, was so pleasing to me. I could really see it. I could understand it. It's touching. It's like meaningful. I really liked the way that she explained what Rainbow Goth is and what it means to her. And Ariana makes physical art, but she also makes clothing and accessories where she tries to be size inclusive and cost effective. Right now she's featuring an emo Christmas sweater and shirt line, but there's other tons of cool designs on her shop to admire and explore. And she's right. Um, these emo Christmas sweaters and shirts are pretty fun. My favorite is the shirt with the Christmas ornament because it says hanging by a thread felt <laughs> felt I also really love the alien shirt that says people aren't real um I I really love both of these shirts I definitely I'm, I think that's going to be my my Christmas sweater the hanging by a thread one I definitely have to order that because I love it I'm going to link rainbow goth in the description box go check it out I'm also going to link Ariana's socials so give Ariana some support say hey to her let her know she's doing a great job because she is, I mean, you're all doing a great job right now. I gotta let you guys know. I see you. I see what you're doing out there. I see that it's not always easy. Sometimes it's a struggle, but you keep pushing, you keep going. And I'm really proud of you. You're all doing amazing. All right. Just getting up sometimes, opening your eyes, getting out of bed and doing what you got to do, even though you don't feel like it. Sometimes that it, it takes a lot of courage and it's a huge feat. And I want you to understand that you're seen and you're appreciated because you are. All right, so that's it for today. Let me know what you think about this case. Let me know if you think there's a possibility Colin Strickland is some secret serial killer and he set Caitlin Armstrong up for this. Let me know if you think that um, Caitlin Armstrong is going to get anywhere on her appeal. Let me know what you think about all of this in general. I can't wait to hear from you in the comment section. I love talking to you guys in there. Like the video if you liked it. Share it if you think it's worth sharing. Subscribe if you haven't already. Hit the subscribe button. I never ask. Okay, I'm asking. Hit, 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 hit the subscribe button. We'll have another video very, very soon. But until then, stay kind, stay beautiful, and stay safe. And we will see each other next time. All right, bye. So you got to let it go I got blood